Good evening. Welcome to Mount Zion, AME Zion Church Bible Study, Wednesday night Bible study. My name is Reverend Sandra Walker. I am an associate minister here at Mount Zion, where Reverend Claude Schubert is the pastor. He's not here today because he's at a general conference in Atlanta, Georgia. So in his absence, he asked me to do the Bible study for him. Mm -hmm. Today we're going to study Luke chapter 13. He asked me to pick whatever the Lord led me to teach. And the Lord, in my dream, kept telling me Luke chapter 13. He kept giving me scriptures out of Luke chapter 13. So now we're going to look at, look at Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. For Jesus calls for repentance. And we're going to look at Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9, where Jesus waits for repentance. And we're going to look at Luke chapter 13, all the way back to the end of the, of the chapter, verses 31 through 35, where Jesus grieves for the lack of repentance. So 1 through 5 is on Jesus calls for repentance. 6 through 9, Jesus waits for repentance. And 31 through 35, Jesus grieves for the lack of repentance. Let us pray. O oh, Father, thou art so gracious and thou art so merciful. We just cry out tonight thanking you for all that you have done for your protection, your watchful eye for your Holy Spirit that leads and guides, for your love, your everlasting love. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to share your word. Oh, Father, I pray right now, as always, to cleanse me, forgive me for my sins, cleanse me, so that you can have a body where you can usher in. And I want you to do the teaching, I want you to do the explaining, so people will understand exactly what you have them to do. Oh, Father, we just thank you for what you're doing, what you have done, and what you are going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Looking at Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, Jesus calls for repentance. Looking at verse 1, it says, Now there were some present at that time, who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood power had mixed with their sacrifices. So some people came in and told Jesus about some Galileans who Pilate had, had, uh, had executed and had mixed their blood with, their, with some sacrifices. All right, I have a question I want to ask you. What do you tell Jesus? What do you tell Jesus? You know, I get a lot of prayer requests. People are sick, and they uh, ask me to broadcast it throughout the church, and I broadcast it in our Bible study ministry, and, and I pray, and we pray for the Lord to heal them, okay, and to give their family peace, okay, while, and strength while the healing is, is, is going through, while they're going through the process of healing. Oh, I get prayer requests if someone has lost a loved one, praying for comfort, for the family, to guide the family, to help them as they make arrangements to, to bear the body of the loved one, knowing that the loved one in Christ Jesus is, is with the Lord. So what what do you tell Jesus? That's what what should we what should we tell Jesus? Now I want you to know I have four questions. Therefore you're gonna get twenty five points for each question if you get it correctly. Think about it and write it down. What do you tell Jesus? Oh, when we look in the Gospels, we see people uh, telling Jesus many things. Uh, a man telling Jesus that his son was suffering from seizures. So that's someone who was sick and wanted Jesus to heal his son. We read about a centurion telling Jesus that his servant was paralyzed. So again, someone is sick and they're telling Jesus, to heal his, 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 his servant. The centurion's telling Jesus to heal his servant. Mary and Martha 
sent word to Jesus about Lazarus. They knew Jesus loved Lazarus and told Jesus that Lazarus was sick. Took, 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 took Jesus four days to get there, okay, and by the time Jesus got there, Martha heard Jesus was there, and she ran to Jesus, and she told him that Lazarus was dead. Throughout the Gospels, we continuously read about sick people coming to Jesus to be healed. We even, we even see in the Gospels where Jesus sees someone who is sick, and he would go to them and heal them. Now, occasionally we hear about things that don't involve sickness or death, uh, like Mary, the mother of Jesus, told him that they were out of wine at this wedding they were attending. Uh, someone told Jesus that, that, that the father had died and the, apparently the brother wasn't treating him right and said, go and tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And today, in, in, in Luke chapter 13, verse 1, we see people coming to Jesus, telling about some Galileans who had been murdered by Pilate. So the question is, what do you tell? What do you tell Jesus? Just what do you tell Jesus? Do you tell Jesus certain things, or do you tell Jesus everything? I'm here to tell you that Scripture says that we can take everything to our Lord Jesus in prayer. Okay. Don't cease talking to Jesus. Don't limit your, your, your concerns to, to or your conversation with Jesus around sickness or around, around death or distress or losing a job or problems. No, 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 no. Take everything to Jesus. The good news and the bad news. Talk to him about everything. Tell Jesus all about it. Tell him all about it. So... If your response was, I take everything to Jesus, give yourself 25 points. That's right. Take everything to Jesus. So today, we see people telling Jesus about some Galileans who were murdered by Pilate. Now, Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea from A.D. 26 to A.D. 70, okay? And I'm going to tell you, Pilate and these Jews just, just didn't get along, okay? They disliked each other. They aggravated each other. Uh, Galilee was the hot spot for Jews with the goal of bringing down Rome, okay? Uh, some think that these Galileans were followers of Judas of Galilee, the founder of the Zealots, whose whole purpose was to get rid of the Roman rule. They disowned Caesar's authority, and they refused to pay tribute to him. These Galileans were, were violent, and they were unwilling to compromise. Therefore, they didn't like Pilate, so guess what? Pilate didn't like them, okay? So he aggravated them. As they aggravated Pilate, Pilate aggravated them. One time, Pilate took money from the temple to build a bridge. How you like that? Took money from a temple to build a bridge. Oh, he would bring statues in, all right, and, and put them all around the city just to just to aggravate them. So they disliked each other, therefore they aggravated each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I have a second question. We constantly hear and read about violence in our world today. How does violence beget more violence? Think about it. How does violence bring about more violence? Write down your answer to that question. How does violence bring about more violence? You got your answer? You ready for the answer? The answer is Violence brings about more violence when we do not forgive. When we do not forgive. You know, when Simon Peter cut off that, that soldier's ear, you know what Jesus said? He said, all that take the sword will die by the sword. In other words, as we like to say, all who live by the sword 
will die by the sword. Now, Jesus taught the disciples and scripture teaches us that we should love our enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Scripture says, vengeance is the Lord's. It's not for us to do vengeance. We are to care for those who, 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 who persecute us. Love them. Do good to those who, are, who hate you. Scripture says, we should forgive. Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we also forgive those who trespass against us. This is serious. When we pray, Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we also forgive those who trespass against us. Very serious. For if you forgive others their trespasses, Scripture says, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But it goes on to say, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Oh, forgiveness is very key. Okay, forgiveness is very key. Violence brings about other violence when we don't forgive, when we try to get revenge. When the Lord said, vengeance is mine, our job is to forgive. Okay, our job is not, is not to get revenge. So, Pilate and these Jews disliked each other, and they showed it. You, you, you do something to me, and I'll do something to you. There was no forgiveness. Therefore, they were living, they were living by the sword. So, verse 1 again says in chapter 13 of Luke, Now, there were some present at that time that told Jesus about these Galileans whose blood power had mixed with their sacrifices. The implication here is that Pilate sent some soldiers in the temple while they were in there worshiping. And they were given orders to execute these Galileans in the act of worship. Then they took their blood and mingled it in with their sacrifices that they were offering. Wow. How tragic. Violence against violence when we don't, when we don't forgive. Now they tell Jesus that, and Jesus' response is a little different from what you would normally think when someone tells you about something tragic happening. Jesus said, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? Listen to what he said. Do you think these Galileans were worse sinners? Now, wait a minute now. What's a worse sinner? What is a worse sinner? Okay, you know, you, you, you worse off. You, you sin more than I do. <laughs> You're a worse sinner. What is a worse sinner? This question number three. So write down your response. What is a worse sinner? I had someone tell me, a young girl tell me. She said, well, this friend of mine is pregnant. She and this guy, they living together. Now she knew I was a minister. And I didn't I didn't say anything. Because I was thinking, well, the reason you in this house paying this high rent every week, three hundred dollars a week, is because you didn't want you to adhere to household rules. You were in college. And you paying all this money out for this for this house, all because there were time limitations on when you can, should be home and you don't want to adhere to the time limitations. So you moved out and got you a house. Now you working, trying to take for this, pay for this house and the utilities and everything else that goes on taking care of a house. Okay, find your food. All because you don't want to hear the household rules. Then I said, well, wait a minute. Sandra Walker, you remember when you got very upset with your mother? Because she did not buy you an outfit you wanted to wear to some event, so you walked out of the house and you going to run away from home. So who was the worst sinner from those three examples? 
You got your you got your response? What's the who's the worst sinner? Let me tell you, we all the worst sinners. We all are sinners. We all have sin, and we all fall short of the glory of God. So we all are the worst sinners. So if that was your response, give yourself 25 more points. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When Jesus came, he didn't come to condemn us because we were already condemned. Yeah, yeah. He came to save us from our sins. Not to condemn us because we were already enemies of God. Okay, we were already condemned. We're all worse sinners. The sin I committed, okay, it, 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 it's, not, it's not worse than your sin. The sin you committed is not worse than mine, or mine not as worse, as, not as bad as yours, or whatever. We all in bad shape. We all needed Jesus. We all needed Jesus. All have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. Jesus came to save us, not to condemn us. So these Jews consider these Galileans to be sinners, the worst type of sinners. You know, they, they for many Jews believe that, you know how some people believe that you got you got good things going on, you got you know, good health and good wealth and you got a nice house, and you got a nice car and you got a good job then then you doing something right. Okay, God has blessed you. God God got you. You you you, you got it. We got God's approval. But if you know you're having hardships and struggling and tragedies and problems going on, then they say, Oh, you must be suffering from God's judgment. Why are all this happening to you? What's going on in your life? People often assume that those who suffered were being punished for sin. Some people, like the Pharisees, would project that the Galileans must have done something truly, truly bad. For God to allow this to happen to them. So the question is, who, who sinned? Who sinned? Oh, I think about Job's friends. You remember Job's friends? And they did good for weeks. They, they visited Job. They kept their mouth closed. But afterwards, they saw Job. They had these sores from the top of his head down to the bottom of his feet. And they just wanted to know. Tell Job, I don't know what you've done, but you need to confess your sins so, so, so you can get better. But they didn't know what God had said in verse 1. Job was blameless. Job was upright. One who feared God and one who shunned evil. They didn't know what God was doing in Job's life. They accused Job of sinning. They didn't know God said, no, no, no. He shunned evil. He's blameless and upright. He feared God. Oh, what about the blind man? Remember the blind man, 40 years blind? Born blind. Born blind. Disciples ran to Jesus and said, Who sinned? This man or his, or his, or his mother or his parents? Okay, why was he born blind? Who sinned? Who sinned? And Jesus said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. Jesus said, What happened to him is so that the works of God might be displayed in him at this particular time. Who sinned? Don't assume that because someone is suffering, they're being punished for their sin. Let the person examine himself to understand why he's struggling. Let the person examine himself to understand why there's distress. Our job is to pray for one another, to love one another, to hug one another, not during a pandemic, but to hug one another, to encourage one another, to comfort one another, to help one another, not to condemn one another. Only God knows the whole story, okay? Not to condemn. We are here to help one another, encourage one another, comfort one another, pray for one another, love one another. So Jesus is going on now looking at verse 4. He said, okay, let me give you, let me tell you something. Uh, those 18 men who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than all the others in Jerusalem? 
You know, Houston, Jerusalem, full of people who, righteous people, you know, God-fearing people. You know, there was this pool near Jerusalem called the Pool of Siloam. And there were 18 men who were probably in the pool purifying themselves. And there was a tower that was over the, over the pool. And the tower fell down and killed the 18 men. So this is very much like the other case where, you know, tragic violent tragedy has occurred. Christ tells them that this is so that they can see that not only Galileans, who they believe were the worst sinners, but even the inhabitants of Jerusalem, who they believe were the righteous people, both of them died, both group of people died from violent death. Suffering does not determine if someone is saved. All people are sinful and will perish if they do not repent. For those 18 uh, who died when the tower alone fell on them, for those Galileans uh, who, 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 uh, who piled a tat, okay, and, and their blood were, were uh, suffering, okay, Jesus said, do you think they were more guilty than the others in Jerusalem? Do you think they were the worst sinners? Jesus' response to both of these was, I tell you no. In both cases, he said, I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. The response to both was, I tell you, no, they were not the worst sinners. But unless you repent, you too will perish. So what do we mean by repent? Now, this is not one of your questions, even though you can write down your answers, okay? What do we mean when we say repent? Repent means to change your mind. To keep from perishing, you need to repent. Change your mind about the way you are living. You need to come to realization that you are a sinner. You need to repent, change your mind, and realize that, and come to realization that you hate the sin. You hate the sin. Scripture says, hate the evil, sinful is evil, hate the sin, and love the good. Now, I like that scripture because it doesn't say love the good and hate the sin. No, hate the, hate the sin, hate the evil came first. Because you don't even understand what is good until you understand what is sinful. Okay? So, hate the sin, then you can love what is good. Now, scripture teaches that, tells us that getting drunk on alcohol is evil. It's sinful. So if you are getting drunk on alcohol, then it's simple, okay? You must hate it. Scripture teaches us that getting drunk from drugs is evil, is sinful. So if you know that getting drunk from drugs is sinful, and if you get drunk on drugs, then you must hate it. Scripture teaches us that prostituting, Living with someone and you're not married to them, okay, is evil, is sinful. And if you know that being a prostitute, living with someone and you're not married to them, is sinful, then you must hate it. The scripture says that stealing, going in the stores, picking up stuff and putting it in your pocket, putting it in your purse, or cheating, cheating on a test, is evil. It's sinful. It's wrong. So you know that stealing and cheating on a test even is sinful. So if you are stealing or cheating, you must hate it. Scripture teaches that lying is evil. It's sinful. You know, you said lying and you giggle about it. No, 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 no. You know, lying is sinful, sinful. If you lie, you must hate it. Scripture teaches us that foul, vulgar language is sinful. It's evil. Now you let a little 
foul bugger word come out of your mouth when you go, like, ooh, I thought you said that, giggling. No, 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 no. It's nothing to giggle about. If you know that it's sinful, then you must hate it. Now, notice that in each case, I said, you know it's sinful, then hate it. You know it's sinful, then hate it. I did not say stop doing it. No, I didn't say that. That's Jesus' job. You got to come to the point where you hate the sin. And you confess that that was wrong, that was sinful. And you ask Jesus, and he said that he will forgive you. And he'll do the cleansing. He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's his job. Your job is to hate the sin. Come to a point where I don't want to do that anymore. That's not right. That's not following God's word. I hate it. Therefore, you must repent and turn to Jesus for a changed lifestyle, okay, to be saved. Realize that you cannot stop it. You can't. I tried it. It didn't work. I had to go to Jesus and get down on my knees and say, Lord, I'm tired of sinning. I believe you came to save me from my sin. Tears rolling down my eyes. I need you. I need you. If you can't stop it, it cannot be stopped. Believe me, three months later, my daughter messed up her clothes. Five years old, we were 30 minutes from church. And she messed up her clothes. And, and, and I looked at her. I took a deep breath and I said, go upstairs and change your clothes. And I went behind her, kept her change clothes. My husband told me later on, he said, you really have changed. Because you know what? That would have been some choice words coming out of my mouth. And I would have been stumping and raging up those steps and stumping and raging off why she changed the clothes and stumping and raging and coming down. I hated doing that. Then I'm all upset because I did it. But guess who stopped it? Jesus stopped it. Confess your sin. You hate that sin. Tell Jesus about it. Turn your life around. Give your life to him. He'll stop it. He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Confess that you hate the sin and ask Jesus to forgive you for a sin. He'll stop it. Jesus said, repent or perish. Those were your choices. Two choices. Repent or perish. He didn't say anything about purgatory. There is no purgatory for you to go to to get things right and somebody gonna pray you into hell no either you repent or you perish decide that your sinful behavior prevents you from going forward decide that you cannot stop sinning on your own decide that you need some help and decide to go to Jesus for your help he didn't come to condemn he came but to save us from our sins Decide to ask Jesus to save you for your sins. Put your faith in Jesus. God gave us his only son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Examine yourself to see if you are of the faith. I'm not, I can't examine you. I can examine me. Examine yourself to see if you are of the faith. Okay, now, Let's look at Luke 13, verses 6 through 9, who talks about Jesus waiting for repentance. Uh, verse 6 says, Then he told this parable, A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. Now, now the fig tree was planted in a vineyard, in a nice vineyard, but they where they, where they take care of the soil, they mix the soil up, put fertilize the soil, make sure it's watered, okay? It's in the better soil. It's usually you find these trees may be on the side where maybe the animals kick some, 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 some soil over there on top of it, okay? They may or may not survive. But no, 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 no. This man took care of this fig tree. 
Okay, they were planted in a vineyard where you have the better soil. This fig tree belonged to a man who cared for the fig tree. He was caring for him. And so the owner of the field, he wanted, he wanted some fruit. He wanted some figs. He goes out there. There's no figs. There's no fruit. Now, now, when we study the Old Testament, we see that fruitful tree was a symbol of godly living. Remember Psalms 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, but stands in the, uh, and nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Then he said in verse 3, he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. The water is flowing around this tree that brings forth its fruit, fruitful tree in its season, whose leaf shall not wither. And whatsoever he, do, he does shall prosper. Oh, in Jeremiah, it talks about uh, 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 the, the fruitful tree. It says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree, again, planted by waters, who spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when he's come. Okay, because you trusted in the Lord. Its leaves will be green. It will not be anxious in the year of drought because you planted by the water. You put your trust in the Lord. Nor will he cease from yielding fruit even in the midst of the drought. Oh, yeah. So this man who took care of the vineyard. So it said in verse 7, For three years I've been coming looking for fruit. I've been taking care of you for three years. I've been watering you, fertilizing you, putting good soil all around you. I'm looking for good fruit. In three years, I have not received any fruit on this tree. Cut it down. Why should I keep using a good soil, a good fertilizer for on this tree when it's not producing any, any fruit? After all, three years is ample opportunity for you to bear some fruit. For three years he found no fruit. He said, cut it down. That tells us that God is long-suffering, not wanting any to perish. But God will not wait forever. <laughs> He's long-suffering, but he won't wait forever. Will you repent? Will you refuse to bear fruit? Will you continue to refuse to live for God and obey him? One day, there will be no more chance, chances. God is merciful. But mercy, his mercy doesn't last forever. Judgment will come. But verse 8 said, there was this gardener who said, uh, he replied, he said, just, just leave it alone one more year, and I'm going to dig around it, and I'm going to fertilize it, and, 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 and if it bears fruit next year, fine, great. But if not, cut it down. He is God's grace, a marriage of favor. He gave the, 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 the tree a little more time. That's what he does for us. He gives us a little more time. He keeps caring, nurturing, okay? But he does say, if you refuse to change, you will be cut down, okay? Uh, Jesus Christ is the fullness of God's grace. He's the fullness of God's love. But if we refuse to hate the sin, even though you know it's sinful, but you keep doing it your way, disobeying God, you will be cut down. I know a lady who said, I just can't become a Christian. I like to gamble. And I know if I become a Christian, Jesus is going to tell me I can't gamble, so I won't be a Christian. Wow. Learn to what? Hate the sin. Or you will be cut down. You will perish. So, uh, uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, says, Jesus calls for repentance. Verses 6 through 9 says, Jesus waits. He is gracious. He waits for repentance. 
and in verses 31 35 we're going to look how Jesus grieves for the lack of repentance verse 31 said at that time some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him leave this place and go somewhere else Herod wants to kill you <laughs> now 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 scholars have said they really don't know the motives of these Pharisees okay it was unknown but when you think about the Pharisees their general attitude is that you know they really wasn't they really weren't interested in in protecting Jesus from any type of danger okay and so maybe they were just simply trying to just get Jesus out of the area and, and remind him that this was this was Herod the one who uh, killed John the Baptist okay and maybe maybe this would cause Jesus <laughs> to be a friend <laughs> I can't help it this would cause Jesus to be a friend and run <laughs> Okay. Jesus said, Go tell that fox. Listen. Jesus said, Go tell that fox. No foul language came out of his mouth. Okay. Hate the sin. Hate the bug of language. Go tell that fox. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow on the third day. I will reach my goal. Jesus said, go tell that fox, that crafty, sly, worthless guy, that he has no control of his life and his ministry. Jesus said, I'm going to do all that the Father tells me to do. He's going to continue to do what, what the Father had in store for him to do. He's going to continue his ministry. He's going to continue to cast out demons. He's going to continue to perform miracles. He's going to continue to heal. Okay? He's going to continue to all his work has been finished. And on that third day, he's going to rise again from the dead. He's going to rise. He's going to come down. He's going to walk around and teach people for the days. Then he's going to ascend to heaven. And one day he's coming back. But he's going to do the work of the Father. I tell him that that Herod wants to kill him did not disturb Jesus. He was going to continue to do his work until he had risen from the grave and gone back to the Father. So verse 33 says, In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day. And surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Okay? He knew he was going to die in Jerusalem. He had a definite purpose. He was going to keep doing his work and complete his work. And he knew that he was going to die in Jerusalem. Okay, Jerusalem, the largest city in Israel, the, 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 the city uh, 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 with the great spiritual and political capital, Jesus knew he was going to die in that city. So he's going to continue his work. He knew what was before him. Peril was not going to stop him from doing what God had planned for him to do. So he says in verse 34, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you are not willing. Jerusalem had a history of rejecting God's prophets. I mean, you read in this scripture where Elijah was hiding in a cave from Jezebel, who said she was going to kill him. And the Lord said, what are you doing, Elijah? And he said, 
I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. I've been zealous for you. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And he said, I am I am left. I'm the only one left. They tried to seek my life. Now, he wasn't the only one left, but he knew they were trying to seek his life. He was out there hiding because that they had a, 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 a trend of uh, uh, tearing down altars and killing the prophets. How often Jesus longed to just wrap his arms around the people in Jerusalem as a chicken wraps her arms around the chicks. But they won't let him. You know, he would have got his arms around them and just hugged them and cared for them and loved them so. But they out to kill him. They want to accept Jesus' love. They want to accept him as the Messiah. They rejected him. Therefore, when you reject him, you secure your faith of destruction. Luke 13 35 says, Look, your house is left to you desolate, forsaken. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Your house, your temple, Jerusalem will be destroyed. Jerusalem will be destroyed. You rejected Jesus, the hope that God gave you to save you, the promised Messiah to save Jerusalem and the temple, and you rejected it, and you will be destroyed. Oh, he loved you so. So much he wanted to wrap his arms around you. Oh, he just grieved he looked at it one time and tears came down his eyes because he saw the city and knew that it was going to be destroyed. Jesus wept because they would not accept him. He's grieving for the lack of repentance. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, Jesus grieved for the lack of repentance. Grieved for the lack of change in your mind about your current lifestyle. Grieved for the lack of hating the sin. Not stopping the sin. Hating the sin. And give your life over to him. Oh, he's waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's grieving. He would have saved you, Jerusalem. He would have saved you, Pharisees. He would have saved you, people on Facebook and Zoom. He loves you. He wants to rescue you. He doesn't want you to perish. If you will allow him. If you will allow him. Examine yourself and see if you are of the faith. I can't examine you. Examine yourself and see if you are of the faith. I got one last question. Question number four is, should you know when you have repented? Should you know when you have repented? Write down your answer. If you know you have repented, Write down on what occasion you repented. I told you about my repentance. I know mine was on Sunday. Okay. I never forget it. How tears came down my eyes. How I got on my knees. How I cried. Say, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. I can't stop it. I'm a mass major. I solve problems. This problem I could not solve. Do you remember? Write it down. Write it down. You know, uh, James, James gives us some hints on how you know when you have repented. He said, come close to God 
and God will come close to you. He said, wash your hands, you sinners. He said, purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let, let there be sadness instead of laughter, giggling. Gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. Should you know when you have repented? If you answer yes, then regardless of what you answer on the last three questions, you answer the main question and you give yourself 100 because you have passed the test. Okay, and you know, because you know you came close to God. You were tired. Yeah, you were tired. You wash your hands and say, hey, I'm tired of this. I'm tired. I wash my hands of all this sin. You purify your heart. You say, I don't want to sin anymore. You committed your loyalty to God. You put your faith in Jesus. The tears come streaming down like the dead man. Or you just have deep sorrow and grief of what you have done. Or maybe you had both. That you honor yourself before the Lord. Scripture says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Examine yourself to see if you are of the faith. Examine yourself. What did you do? If you haven't done it, it's not too late. Remember, Jesus what? He, he's waiting for you to repent. He said what? I'm going to fertilize some more. Give them more time. I'm going to take care of you. Because I'm trying to get you ready so you won't perish. Repent or perish. Examine yourself to see if you are of the faith. In conclusion, I want to say Ecclesiastes says there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. There's a time to be born and there's a time to die. Between the birth and the death is a dash on your obituary which talks about which talks your, your life. What did you do on the dash? Examine yourself to see if you are of the faith. In verses 1 through 5 of chapter 13, Jesus called for repentance. That were no worse, there are no worse sinners. All have sinned, he said. Repent or perish, he said. There is no purgatory. In verses 6 through 9, we saw Jesus waiting for the repent. Give him more time, he said. Give him more time. I'm going to fertilize some more. Give him more time. He's waiting for the repentance. In verses 31 through 35, Jesus grieves. For the lack of repentance. So he just wants to hug you and love on you and care for you. But you won't let him because you're going to do things your way if you don't repent. You don't hate the sin. You're just playing around with it, doing things your way. So Jesus is grieving. Jesus said, repent or perish. If you do not repent, you will perish. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your mercy. And we thank you for your grace. You have been so good to us. 
You sent your only begotten son to save us from our sins. He walked the earth. He suffered. And he died. Not because he was sinful. He died for our sins. And to prove that he had all power in his hand, he rose again from the dead to let us know, I got all power in my hand. He came to save us from our sins. If we put our trust in him, oh, what a great day it would be. We would be like that tree planted by the rivers of waters. Oh, problems will come, but we know that you said that when we give our life over to you, that you made us a one of your children, all the, the promises of the righteous, because you made your children righteous, all the promises of the righteous belong to us. You said you, we can cast our cares upon you, and you will care for us. You said we can cast our cares upon you, and you will sustain us. You say you hear the prayers of the righteous, and you will relieve us from all of our distresses, all the promises, all the promises. You say you will take care of us. You will supply all of our needs because you are our shepherd. I shall not want. Oh, Father, I just pray now that anyone on this broadcast who has not repented, who has not come to the point where they changed their mind about their lifestyle, I pray right now that Holy Spirit, you will convict their heart and they'll come to their right senses and they learn to hate the sin and they will grieve over their sins. They'll come to you and ask you to save them from their sins because they can't do it themselves. And what a day of rejoicing that would be. Because you will take over and you will work it out. Whatever's going on, you will work it out. Oh, for the loving and faithful God we serve. Oh, for the gracious and merciful God we serve. Oh, Father, I thank you. I thank you for being our Father. I thank you for being our watchful eye. I thank you for your protection. I thank you for your care. I thank you for never leaving us. I thank you for not forsaking us. I thank you, Father, for all that you have done. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father, all honor and glory belong unto you. Now to you who is able to keep us from falling. And present us faultless before your throne. Oh, God, our Father. Oh, Jesus, our Savior. Oh, Holy Spirit, our Comforter. I thank you and praise you for looking at us. Looking at us. And pouring down your grace upon us. Oh, Father, righteous God, we pray and thank you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Have a blessed week. If you are saved, go out and tell others what you did. Tell others what God has done for you. Spread the word. Don't keep it to yourself. God wants you to spread the word. And tell others what a good God he served. If he healed your body, spread the word. If he opened doors and gave you the best job ever, spread the word. Or if he gave you peace that surpasses all understanding, God, go spread the word. You're a child of God now. If you have repented, you're a child of God. And you got a testimony on what you used to do and what you now do. Go out and spread the word and tell folks about Jesus. Oh, I just love telling folks how I used to walk over looking down at the ground. Okay? Because I had I was in a car accident. And how, and how a young man five years later prayed for me over at Alabama State University in front of Palson Hall. And as he prayed, I felt a sharp pain in my back that came all the way up to the top. And I've been standing up straight ever since. Tell him what God has done for you. Oh, man, I got so many testimonies, I tell you. Tell him how God saved you. Tell him how God saved you. i never forget when I was a child taking swimming lessons. My first lesson, the, 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 uh, the, the guard told me, he said, just put your head down, hold your breath, put your head down. He was going around telling us that. I decided, I was a child now, I was a child, I was young, I was young. I decided I wasn't going to hold my breath. I went down, didn't hold my breath. And I saw this pretty place. Oh, the sky was pretty. 
the, the grass was green and I saw this bright light and everybody was laughing so happy and I was trying to get to the light and the boy said who is this and I said this is Sandra Bruce and the boy said go back and next thing I heard was the lifeguard saying breathe 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 and I asked my mother years, years later, I didn't talk about it because I was just so confused. I used to walk around that park and I never saw this pretty place. I said, where's this pretty place? So I didn't understand what had happened until the, I got, until I got older, okay? And I never could find, and I asked my mother, I said, what happened? This was a few years ago, I asked her that and she said, well, I saw you there and you were going down and floating and I got the lifeguard's attention because he was passing back because everybody else was holding that breath and standing back up again. I'm the only one who wouldn't hold the breath. And lifeguard came, she said, and got me out the water, put me on the side of the pool, start pumping my chest, and I woke up. I remember none of that. I want you to know that I was a child, I didn't know what I was doing, God sent me back, okay? But I want you to know that yes, a heaven, when, God, when the Word of God says that when you die in Christ, you just transition, you never die. Your body is gone, but you never die. You just transition, you just transition onto this beautiful place where people are laughing and giggling, and they're so happy, and, they, and it's real bright. Oh yes, when we all get to heaven, what a wonderful place that will be when we all get to heaven. What a gracious place that will be when we all get to heaven and we see our Lord Jesus Christ. Repent. Don't perish. Repent. Put your heart and your life in Jesus' hand. He will take care of you. So go out. Okay. Tell others what God has done for you. Bless you now. May the peace of God rest and rule with you now and forever. Have a blessed week. Goodbye.